Welcome to episode 63 of the Twig Snapper podcast. Today we're joined by Brian Wilson. And it's not Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. It's Brian Wilson from the FPHL. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on today, Alex. Yeah, of course. I'm glad you uh, you were able to come on. So we're going to talk about a variety of different things throughout your career. Um, we'll mainly focus on your pro career. There's a few things I want to touch on before that. And I want to start with a picture I saw on your Instagram from back in your junior days. Um, you were with the Oilers and the AJHL and you had a green mohawk. So I want to know where the inspiration from that came from. Uh, yeah, so that, was, uh, that wasn't just like a personal style choice, uh, as hard as that might be to believe. Um, no, that, was, uh, that picture was taken during playoffs. Um, we just we wanted to do something fun for playoffs as a team. Um, it was actually, <laughs> it was between the Green Mohawks or cul-de-sacs, which I don't know if you, you know what the cul-de-sac no. is, but it's like the old man, like, uh, shave out the middle of your head. Leave <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, yeah. You literally got like a, a cul-de-sac up on top of your head <laughs> with no hair. Yeah. Um, you know, out of the two, I'm kind of thankful we chose the, uh, the Mohawks. I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I would have been able to pull off the cul-de-sac and who knows, uh, you know, yeah. Who, who, it, who it's not going to grow back for. So, uh, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. So risky one. Gets, yeah. So the whole team had green Mohawks. Uh, the whole team had green Mohawks. Yeah. So everyone line up for the anthem, take their buckets off and there's just a line of green Mohawks across the ice. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Everyone's was a little bit, a little bit different, you know, depending on their, yeah. their hair and uh, some, some weren't as green as others. I was, uh, I got mine quite green. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm a bit biased, but I would say uh, it was probably one of the better uh, executed ones on the team. But yeah, definitely. No, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I always like when teams do something different for playoffs. I saw it was a club hockey team guy. I think he played at Missouri and for their playoffs, he, he had like painted in his hair the like Missouri colors and like the Missouri logo or something, which was kind of something I hadn't seen before. So that's, yeah. that's kind of neat. Um, we'll touch briefly on your time, your, uh, college hockey uh, you played at niagara university it's definitely a program that's like getting better every year like this year they lost to canisius in the conference championship game um you played 84 games for them five shutouts throughout your your years there and you were also a hobie baker candidate one of those years so i guess i don't know where you want to start if i like i kind of want to start how you got recruited and then kind of touch you know a little bit on the hobie baker candidate and some of that stuff yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I had a great, uh, great experience there in my four years in Niagara. Um, I got recruited uh, pre pretty late um, after my 20-year-old season in the BCHL. Um, you know, I had a pretty good season there. Didn't get anything set in stone by the end of that season. So, um, you know, come the summertime there, I was still trying to figure out what I was doing. And there happened to be, uh, there was a coaching change at Niagara um so the the coach there now uh jason lammers he was uh he was coming in as the new coach and uh they had, they had a goalie committed already for that season who decommitted once they made that coaching change so then there was an opening there yeah uh, just got connected with with lammers and uh things came together pretty quickly there uh because you know both sides were in a bit of uh, an interesting spot so we we're trying to get something done quickly and um I was actually, I committed there. It was a weird time. I committed there like before we even had assistant coaches hired or anything yet. So, um, you know, I think it was kind of interesting just doing everything through the head coach. A lot of, a lot of guys you talk to in college or it's usually the assistants that do a lot of the recruiting for guys. So, um, I guess it was a little bit unique in that sense. And then, yeah, in terms of my, my time there, uh, was pretty lucky to end up in, uh, in a pretty fortunate situation for myself where, you know, I had a, I had a chance to really earn an opportunity to play uh, coming right in as a freshman. Uh, you know, I played a lot of games my freshman year, my sophomore year. I um, was fortunate enough to, you know, it's also to just be surrounded by some amazing people there. Uh, had some really, really great goalie partners, uh, some great teammates and great staff as well. 
Uh, and then, yeah, that, that junior year there, uh, I had a really, really hot start to the season. I ended up getting the, the Hobie Baker nominee, uh, the nomination there. And that was, I mean, really cool to just kind of, you know, it's, uh, it's obviously, you know, I didn't go on to win the thing, but uh, it's kind of something cool to just, uh, it's a little feather in the cap kind of to just have that, uh, you know, know that at one point I was nominated for such a, a prestigious award. Uh, it was, you know, pretty, pretty big honor to be just even in that conversation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like you said, you didn't win it, but only so many guys are nominated for it. So that in yeah. itself is an awesome achievement. Um, yeah, I think that was a pretty good kind of summary of your college career. So people kind of know some background on on where you came from, um, different things. But let's let's get into the good stuff, the the pro stuff. Um, starting with last year, you I think you, I counted on elite prospects. You were with seven different teams throughout the year um and i've heard a lot of stories from guys playing in the coast the sb and the fp about like how hectic pro hockey gets i mean you know one day you don't have a team and then the next day somebody gives you a call and you've got to drive 15 hours and play on no sleep and i mean you know you're packing your bags at three in the morning or you know all these different crazy stories um and you were all over the place so i guess give us a little bit of a kind of a summary on that hectic year all right. How long you got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So not seven teams is correct. Uh, seven teams, four leagues. So that was uh, quite the journey. Um, I was joking around that, uh, you know, I just, I just needed to get in as like an emergency backup or something for a game in the NHL. Just may probably be the first guy to touch five leagues in a season. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, but no, it was uh, it was quite the interesting year. Uh, started off in Evansville in the SPHL. Uh, I was there for about a month. I uh, didn't really get much of an opportunity to, to get in games there, unfortunately. Um, ended up getting released there right before we were going on a road trip to Vermilion County. Um, so I'm sitting back at the apartment just kind of waiting seeing what's going on i didn't have a car there so i was just kind of stuck just sitting around in my room waiting for them to play and get back from the road trip and uh first intermission of their game that night with vermilion county i get a call from uh vermilion's head coach it's like what get, calls me up says uh hey we just had a goalie go down with injury i saw you're on the waiver wire like uh we got a game tomorrow night can you be here I'm like, well, I don't have my gear with me. It's at the rink. I don't have a car. Uh, so I got a few logistical things to figure out. But, uh, you know, I'll do my best to be there for, for the game tomorrow night and uh, be in the lineup. So uh, ended up making, uh, you know, making a reservation for a rental car online. Ubered to the rental car place the next morning. Uh, picked up the rental car, drove to the rink, picked up my gear drove back to the apartment, gathered all my stuff up, put it all, packed it all up in the car, drove to Vermillion County, backed up that night, ended up going in in relief. Um, honestly, really just didn't have a, didn't have a great performance for myself, but it was, it was a bit of a, a hectic uh, 24 hours. And then uh, I was staying in it. They, they had me up in a hotel that night. And uh, the next morning, Moved into a, um, an apartment with one of the guys. Just finished moving my stuff in. Got a call from my my agent. Said, "Hey, Cincinnati's looking for a guy in the coast." I'm like, "Oh, all right." So I just didn't even. I hadn't even opened my suitcase. I grabbed my suitcase, brought it back downstairs, put it in the car. Got in the car, drove to Cincinnati. Um, all the while, I'm in this rental car that I got from Evansville. That I don't know. If, you know, there's like been like a car shortage the last uh, little while, and that was kind of in the middle of it. So they were like, "Yeah, you can rent this car, but you have to return it to this location in Evansville." So I'm like, "All right, well, Vermilion County is only three hours away. I'll, I'll figure it out somehow." But then I'm now I'm moving on to Cincinnati. I'm still in this rental car. I'm like, "Holy crap! What am I gonna <laughs> do?" Um, so I, you know, I take it take it to Cincinnati. Sorry, I know this is a bit of a long-winded answer. No, here, no, this but, is this uh, is good. <laughs> it's uh, you know, I drive to Cincinnati. I'm there for 
I don't know, maybe a week or so. And then uh, Vermilion, I don't even know how to explain how this all went down. Vermilion was going on a road trip to Roanoke. I was supposed to, I had been staying in a hotel in Cincinnati that whole time for about a week. And they had been like, all right, we finally have an opening in the apartments here. We're going to get you to move in with uh, such and such guy after practice. I'm like, all right. So after practice, I'm like, I go over to the guy. I'm like, hey, man, I'm moving my stuff in uh, with you today. He's like, what? We, you know, we, we had a guy come down from the A that, uh, like, not, not a goalie, but just a, you know, a player came down from the A. And uh, he's already moving his stuff into my apartment right now. I'm like, oh, what? We tell the coach and they're like, oh, okay. I don't know what the confusion's about. And then uh, they're like, all right, hang on, Willie. We'll uh, let us figure this out. Give us like 10 minutes or so. They come back out in 10 minutes, call me in the office. They're like, uh, hey, we're actually, uh, we're going to release you. Vermilion County is coming through town. They're going on a trip to Roanoke. They had just acquired a guy that had a little bit more East Coast experience. So they wanted to take him on to be their goalie. And uh, so we kind of did like a goalie swap off the bus of Vermilion <laughs> County. I brought all my life belongings onto this bus in Vermilion County. Had Still had my rental car situation to deal with. So I, I ended up just, I just gave it to the Hertz or whatever uh, in, in Cincinnati and just, you know, deal with it. I don't know. I, I got no other options here. You're going to have to take my car. And then, uh, yeah, I went on a trip to Roanoke. So that was my second time back with Vermilion County. And then uh, ended up getting released from Vermilion County a few weeks later. Um, after that, stayed for about a week in, in limbo with my buddy in, uh, in St. Louis. Actually, one of my goalie partners from, from Niagara University there. And, uh, and then kind of got things sorted out, went to Danbury. And then from there... Uh, I guess the journey was only about halfway done for my season. <laughs> I did. I had a, I had a call up for like a day to uh, Worcester in the East coast league. Um, so I just went up and backed up a game for them in Maine. Um, after that, went right back to Danbury. Then I had a call up to uh, Springfield in the A, uh, which was a really cool experience. And then after that, uh, I, I actually got a text while I was in Springfield to, uh, to come down to Birmingham in the SP. So after I was done in Springfield, I gathered up all my stuff from the hotel room in Springfield, drove to Danbury, gathered up all the stuff I had there, drove down to Birmingham, was there for about a month, and then uh, ended up coming back and finishing out the year in Danbury. So it was, it was a whirlwind. That was yeah. like probably the longest answer you've ever had on here. <laughs> well, I mean, you went, like you said, every league except for the NHL. And then, yeah. you know, you were driving across half the country with the same team and then a different team and then back with the same team and then a different team. <laughs> yeah. Just an absolute crazy experience. Um, but I guess let's touch on the, the AHL call up. Like, like, how often does that happen where guys who are on an FPHL team? get a call up to the a i mean I, for me i always guess i always thought it would just be like a coast guy is gonna go up if they need somebody yeah yeah so it's uh i guess especially last year um and the last couple of years it's been a little bit more complicated with covid mm -hmm. um it's just harder you know uh just to to get certain guys moving around um, but also just with the structure of, you know, how it works, the NHL, AHL East coast, they can't just call up any East coast league guy. Cause all these guys are, you know, a lot of these guys are affiliated with NHL teams. So yeah. they can't just call up a guy from the closest ECHL team. Cause he's probably affiliated with somebody else. So, um, and it's too much of a pain to call up the guy who's affiliated with their team depending how far the team is. And, right. and in, in last year's case, I was up there because um, that guy was out with COVID. Uh, so he couldn't be called up regardless. So, um, you know, I guess uh, tough, tough break for him, but uh, it was, it was a fun experience for me. Um, I, I, I know the, uh, 
the goalie coach there in, in Springfield. Um, I've, I've worked with him for quite a while. So uh, that's kind of how I got connected there. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic experience. And like you said, I was, uh, you know, very lucky to, to have that. Not a lot of guys in my situation uh, are fortunate enough to, to get that experience. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely a cool experience. And you had another one this year. Um, but first, I guess we could talk a little bit about Danbury because you've kind of found a home. You've settled down. You've been there the whole year other than your call up. Uh, you're leading the league in wins, second in save percentage, second in goals against. You were the FDHL goalie of the month in February. So you're having a lot of success. The team's having a lot of success. Obviously, they go hand in hand. Um, but yeah, I guess just talk about that for a little bit. You know, you finally after last year's insanity driving all over and bouncing teams when you settle down you're actually having success yeah it's uh it is nice to just kind of have that uh sense of comfort a little bit i guess and just uh you know get a new routine and i'm in the same place every day and um, you know building relationships with guys i found that's kind of the biggest difference coming out of college and a pro is uh you're not really, you're not able to, to forge the same relationships with guys. Cause you're not, you know, coming in, it's not like, all right, I'm going to be here for four years with, with all this, this group of people. And I'm going to have four years to kind of build up connections with these guys. It's like, yeah, you come into a locker room and, um, you know, you meet a team of guys and that group could be different by next week. Um, you just, or literally by tomorrow, you just don't know. Um, so it's been kind of nice to to be able to grow with uh, the group here. Um, we have a lot of really good guys here, and like you said, the in terms of the success, like it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, like so much of a goalie's success is uh, is related to the team in front of them. You know, um, we have some some teams, you know, a couple teams at the bottom feeders of this of the league here that have really good goalies that just, you know, they, they don't have good numbers uh, just cause you know, you're kind of, you're a little bit at the mercy of, of the guys in front of you. Right. So if they do their job, well, it, it allows us to do our job well back there. Uh, so, you know, any, any personal success this year, it, a lot of credit goes to the guys and uh, you know, there's a reason that our record is, is what it is this year um, because we, we have a lot of guys that are, that are committed and uh and they got a lot of skill and uh you know they're they're putting in the work every day so yeah definitely i mean what you said is so true about there being a lot of good goalies on on bad teams i mean you see it through i remember watching a lot of high school hockey and some of the worst high school teams I and mean, the guys would take 60 shots a game the goalies were really good but they, the team would still get mercied because there was just nothing in front of them you see in the nhl too like i i'm a big ducks guy and John Gibson and he's a really good goalie, but there's just nothing in front of him. The team sucks. So his numbers yeah. aren't good, but I mean, he does everything he can and makes insane saves. But like you said, you don't have a team in front of you. There's really only so much you can do. And then exactly. you get tired fast too. Obviously being a goalie, you're making save after save after save, you get worn out. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like, I think the biggest thing is, you know, there's a difference between, you know, facing 30 shots where your team keeps it, you know, keeps the other team to the perimeter, to the outside and facing 30 shots where 25 of them are, you know, mid slot or back door or something like yeah. that. So you're just naturally, uh, you know, if you're, if your defense isn't as tight in front of you, even if you're, let's say you're not one of those teams that's facing, you know, a huge workload in terms of like amount of shots, but they're not good with, with uh, limiting those seam passes and, and plays from the slot and stuff like that that's right. going to have a detri detrimental effect on your, your numbers and stuff too. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's touch on that AHL call up this year too. I'm not going to lie. I, when I saw that, I saw, I, I follow a bunch of, I don't know, FPHL guys. And I saw that and I was like, wow, that's really cool. This guy from the FPHL, you got to call up to the AHL. Wouldn't it be awesome to get him on the pod? But I was like, ah, there's probably no way I'm going to get a hold of him. And well, here you are. Um, so now you got to tell us the story about how you got there this year. Yeah. So, uh, that's, that's kind of a funny story. Um, so I actually, we're not, we're not too far from Bridgeport here, uh, which is where that game was about 45 minutes. 
And um, one, of, one of my teammates here in Danbury had actually been bugging me like, hey, like, let's go out to watch a, a Bridgeport game. Like, that'd be cool. I'm like, yeah, all right. So I actually had tickets for that game, uh, <laughs> for the, the Bridgeport Belleville game. And uh, we had practice Thursday morning. And I was talking to him in the dressing room after. There was actually, it ended up there was going to be a group of about six of us going. And uh, I had gotten all the tickets set up. So, uh, you know, I was letting those guys know, hey, like, I got all the tickets. You know, they're on my phone. We're good to go for tonight. And uh, as I'm, like, you know, making sure everything's good with the tickets, I get a, I see that a text rolled in from uh, Justin Peters with, uh, he's, he's the goalie guy there with uh, Belleville. And he was like, "Hey, uh, I got your number from uh, from the the Springfield goalie coach there. Uh, you know, we we just had a goalie go down to morning skate, and uh, we need a guy for tonight if you're available. And uh, you know, obviously, that's a pretty pretty tough. Uh, you don't want to turn down that that opportunity. Yeah. So I was like, "Hey, uh, I, I guess I don't need those tickets anymore. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'll be at the game. Bit of a different seat, but uh, yeah." Yeah, so that was uh, that was pretty cool how that all came together. Um, and again, just one of those experiences you got to be thankful for when you get it. Um, you know, we touched on it with the the stuff from last year going up to Springfield. Like it's, uh, you know, it's a situation that there's there's not a ton of guys that uh, have played in the FP that get a chance to to go up and and experience uh, a league like the A. So um, you know, just very fortunate that I got to be able to to do that yeah i mean even though you didn't play you still got to put the jersey on you still got to skate around and warm ups. you still got to experience it all um and like you said there's so many guys that that are never going to experience it no matter how hard they work they're not going to get that chance and then i'm assuming all of your your teammates that had tickets were there in the stands watching so that had to be kind of kind of fun yeah so they went and um there was actually like a bunch more that ended up getting tickets uh, when they found out. So uh, I had a pretty big uh, fan contingency there. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. It was, it was uh, a tough game from our side there in, in Belleville, but um, at the end of the game, you know, we're getting off the ice and I was kind of the last guy moseying off the ice. And I had like a group of 30 guys up in the stands, just roaring, making the, making the building loud there uh cheering as i skated by them getting off the ice so uh that was pretty funny um and a pretty cool experience it was really nice that they were uh that they were all there kind of out yeah. uh, supporting and and watching just you know in case uh something happened i did get in there so yeah definitely that is awesome um let's talk a little bit about like the fphl itself um i mean I've, a lot of people know there's some crazy stuff that happens in fphl games you got a lot of guys i mean before the puck drops they're like you want to fight and then as soon as the puck drops they're they're beating each other's brains out you see a lot of brawls you know different from time to time stuff you don't see in the nhl because the you know the, the refs will break it up before it even comes close um so in any of the games you've played in and i know you guys have uh a guy who's known through minor pro hockey as being a fighter, Daniel Amesbury, Diamond Hands. Um, so have you seen anything in your games playing any, you know, notable brawls, fights, anything interesting? Uh, it's just, I don't know if there's like one that stands out. It's just, uh, it's just like how big of a part of the game that is, uh, down in, in the, uh, in the fed here. And, um, to an extent, even in the SP still. Um, Yeah, it's, it's a significant part of the game. And I kind of realized that last year um, playing against Watertown, who ended up winning the league. They were, they were a skilled team, but they also had a a real nasty edge to them. And like, there was, you know, there was no hiding out there. Um, You know, there were, there were guys that would take liberties on anyone didn't really care, you know, yeah. the consequences. They knew they could beat anyone up that came after them. And, and uh, you know, things aren't called necessarily as tightly in the Fed all the time as, uh, you know, got, like coming from college, everything gets called. There's no, you know, after the whistle scrums and, and right. up in, you know, up in the show in the A, it's a different game. It's, you know, it's a, it's a high paced skilled game and they're, they're not worried about that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, down here, it's, it's, it's a huge part of the game. And I think, 
um, you know, that Watertown had a lot of success last year and they won the league because they had that skill and then they had that toughness that just kind of set them over the edge. Um, so it's, it's nice to have a guy like that on our team this year um, who can kind of, you know, I think he strikes some fear in the, into the opponents. Uh, Cause you know, you just, you don't know what you're going to get, you know, um, right. you might get crushed in open ice. You got to keep your head up a little bit more. He's had some just massive hits this year. Um, you know, you do something stupid, you're going to have to answer. And you're probably, you know, it's probably not going to go well <laughs> right. for you. So, right. Um, and, he, and he's got that reputation outside of hockey with ice is war and then the uh, the boxing he does and, like, other stuff. So he's got, like, that other, like, just fighting reputation, like, yeah. aside from hockey. Yeah, exactly. So um, guys are kind of aware of it. And, and I think, like, to an extent, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, it it kind of affects how guys play and they, they kind of know when he's on the ice and maybe play a little bit more uh, with a little bit more fear in them. So, um, you know, say what you want about it. I'm not necessarily the biggest advocate for like, uh, you know, fighting or whatever. I'm a goalie. I just want to play the game, make some saves (laughs) and whatever, but, uh, you know, say what you want, but I I do think it, uh, it helps us and hopefully it's going to help us here, uh, on a playoff run. But, uh, so you're saying yeah. you wouldn't jump into a brawl as a goalie? Because once in a while you see that, you know, the goalies are jumping in the middle of the brawls too. You're saying you, you wouldn't do that? Yeah, I uh, I don't know. I think I'm more of a lover than a fighter. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, you never know when, when uh, you know, you're kind of, sometimes you're just backed into a corner and you're forced into something like that. But yeah, I'm not really, uh, I don't foresee myself as the kind of guy that uh, goes looking for it. Um, right <laughs> so you probably won't be catching me in any goalie fight soon but uh you know i think mark andre Fleury also said that a couple weeks ago and then ended up in a fight like two days later so um, <laughs> yeah. right so now you're gonna be in one really uh, within the next couple of weeks yeah so i mean who knows keep an eye out keep an eye out yeah, yeah. we'll definitely have to now yeah. um and then also maybe you could touch on like the skill of the FPHL. I feel like a lot of people don't understand how good the hockey actually is. Um, I don't know if you, you know who Travis Rigdon is. He does the sling and biscuit podcast, all the videos. He's been posting a lot of like life in the fed videos. And he's talked about the skill and how a lot of people think that it's just a beer league and they can go in there and just light it up. Um, so maybe you could touch on that and how good these guys actually are. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it is, uh, it's definitely better than, than you might think, uh, than the average person might think like it's definitely better than, than, a you know, just a beer league. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit surprising, I think to, to guys and myself included coming in last year, it's like, uh, you know, it is an interesting mix of skill yeah. that you get, you know, you got some guys that it's like, yeah, yeah okay uh you know not maybe he's not the best hockey player you know there might be something out, else out there for him but uh then you got other guys where it's like you know holy smokes this guy is good and just isn't at the next level for one one reason or another whether it's like personal choice or or just like you know maybe there's a certain hole in his game that just doesn't fit at the next level but still is like very highly skilled you know um yeah. so there are i find every team has you know like two or three guys that that are you know at least two or three guys were lucky and danbury and some of the other top teams like have you know a few lines full of guys that are that are very skilled um you know that have played good hockey growing up um you know into their college years or wherever they might have played and um yeah it's it is a little bit underrated i think it uh it gets a bad rap uh, a little bit the fed but um there are some there are some good players down here so yeah i don't know maybe people just think of slap shot when they think of the fed or, or i don't <laughs> i mean understandable yeah and you know once in a while you see those those big brawls and it kind of fits but um, yeah you know and i think people also sometimes they associate skill level with the amount of pay they look at the nhl guys are getting huge paychecks and then they look down at the fp and they see a smaller paycheck like well they obviously aren't that good because they're not getting paid that much which is kind of a stupid you know, way to look at it. But I feel like that's just kind of a way some people look at things like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, 
don't get me wrong. We're, we're not in the NHL here. There's, there's a reason why those guys are, are yeah. paid more, but, um, yeah, no, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not necessarily as big of a gap as you might think. It's not like, uh, you know, right. And the NHL like you, to you know, beer league. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the fact that you've had some AHL call-ups, I mean, they wouldn't call you up from a beer league unless they were absolutely desperate. And usually the e-bug goalies have had some sort of, you know, decent hockey experience throughout their lives at one point or another, whether it's been a while or not. Um, So, I mean, some of that stuff shows too, or you see guys in the SP or, or the FP once in a while, maybe they're invited to an NHL camp and, you know, they spend time with the camp because they've got a connection or or different things. And, and like, I mean, you, you played D1 hockey. There's guys that played high level college hockey, high level juniors. They've played overseas. They've played in the AHL or the, the, the coast. And, you know, this is where they are now. So you've got that, like you said, kind of mix and, and, you know, some guys, maybe they're just older. I mean, I can't remember who it was, but there's some guy who, I don't know if he still is in the FBHL, but he had a pretty lengthy NHL career. Uh, Ian White, um, that's who you're yeah, thinking Yeah, Ian White. Thinking, yeah. So, I mean, like, he just wants to keep playing hockey. Obviously, he's yeah. older, and but, I mean, a heck of a hockey player, too. So, I mean, you look at stuff like that, too, and, you know, kind of speaks to the talent. Um, why don't we – and I know you told me you've been thinking about it for a long time, but everybody likes a good story, whether it's hockey-related or it's just something funny, but end on yeah. a funny story of some kind, something. Okay. A funny story of some kind. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned to you earlier, I'm not uh, not known to be the best storyteller. I don't know. So um, far, your your story about your like year and stuff, that was pretty good. Yeah. So I, I, my, my funnier stories are probably already mixed in here. But um, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll come, uh, come up with one that uh, it was kind of it was my first time coming to Danbury and experiencing the Fed. And yeah. Um, I didn't, didn't know what to expect and kind of like, like we talked about, you know, I, I already kind of had a certain perception built on it of, you know, like the, you know, it's a fighting league and, you know, the skill, it's probably not the best. Um, but I, I show up here and, uh, coming in for our first game, um, show up for the game, getting dressed with the guys, whatever, you know, all's good. And, uh, like 15 minutes before on ice warmups, this guy comes rolling in the locker room. I had seen him around the rink during the week for, for practice. I didn't really know who he was. Like he wasn't always in full gear at practice, whatever comes in the room with his hockey bag, like 15 minutes before, which is like very late to, you know, show up for a program pro game and, you know, just throws gear down in his stall and starts getting dressed. I'm like, all right, I, I, I'm not really sure what, what's going on here but okay and uh he comes out for you know takes warm up with us and uh he's got no shoulder pads on he's wearing a fedora out there and i'm like what is what have i gotten myself into what's going on here um he only he only took warm ups with us he didn't play that game and then uh so i ended up putting up a, a shutout in that game um so that was that was nice putting one up in my first game with uh, with Danbury, and then the next night, similar thing. He shows up again, comes out for warm up, same get up, you know, no shoulders, get the fedora going, just patrolling the red line, you know, for the warm ups. I'm like, who is this guy? What's this guy doing? But all right, <laughs> and he uh, he plays that night, and uh, he was playing on D, and I had another shutout going. Um, with about five minutes left in the third, he gets the puck, lots of time and space back in the D zone. I think the other team was like changing or something. And he just, he kind of took the puck back into the corner. He's sitting there with it, looking around, tries to throw like a cross ice sauce pass, kind of flubs it, puts it right to there. Like, I think it was their best player sitting in the slot and just had all the time in the world, picked a corner, you know, ruin the ruin the back to back shutouts there with about five minutes left. It's like, ah, you know, that kind of sucks. But you know, I went over to him like, hey, don't worry about it. Like, it is what it is. You're you're all good. You know, he was apologetic. I'm like, hey, you know, it's no big deal. Just a goal. Like, we were we were still we were gonna win the game. Um, yeah. 
And uh, he's like, oh, I owe you a beer. I'm like, no, no, you're good. Don't worry. You just, like water under the bridge. You're all good. And uh, come to find out later, I, I had, you know, it was my first week with the team. I didn't know who everybody was. It was the, uh, he's our GM. <laughs> <laughs> and he's our, he's our head coach this year. And I'm like, oh. All righty. Well, hey, good thing I didn't, uh, you know, go after him too hard. You know, yeah, you uh, like chew him out. Like, what the hell, man? Why'd you do make that pass? You screwed up my shot. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, no, I don't. I don't know if I don't know if he'll uh, he'll hear this or not. But uh, that was uh, that was so a pretty wh- funny experience for me. So. Why the fedora? I, I I don't know. He just. I mean, he's uh, he's a hat guy. Likes wearing uh, different styles of hats that are a little bit more unconventional these days. And uh, you, like, if you ever see a picture of him uh, on our benches here, he's, he's, uh, he's always got a nice hat going. So um, I don't know, I guess he just decided uh, to pull out a fedora, but uh, it was uh, pretty interesting. I'll probably remember that one for a long time. Um, yeah. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> unex- unexpected. And, you know, it was kind of like, Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, just not not how not how I saw, uh, you know, things going there. But right, when you think of a GM, you don't think about the guy who shows up like kind of late and like you know skating around with a fedora before the game. You know? Yeah, well, I, I assume I assume he walked into the locker room late because he was probably you know doing GM yeah. stuff in his office. Yeah, right? you yeah. know, uh, I, I'm sure he was at the rink. He just wasn't in the room. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, that was, uh, that was all time funny right there. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably about the best I got though for, uh, for, uh, for a funny story. But, no, no, that's pretty yeah. good. And that's something that you probably only see in the fed or maybe the SP. Um, yeah. yeah. So that, that's a good one. Before we end, I do have to ask, I mean, your name being Brian Wilson and Brian Wilson in the beach boys. Do you like the beach boys? Uh, I'm not like an avid fan. Um, I also, you know, I don't have anything, uh, necessarily against them, uh, obviously, but I, you know, I'm not, uh, sitting here listening to their music on repeat 24 <laughs> seven. Um, yeah. actually, so funny enough, I, I, I another little story for you. If that's all right. <laughs> okay. but, yeah. Yeah. Of uh, course. Uh, yeah. So when I was at Niagara, my freshman year our uh, it was like close to the end of the season and, uh. I remember I made a big save in, in the game or whatever. And, uh, and I hear on the, you know, on the PA or whatever, they, they start playing lying in bed, just like Brian Wilson did. And, uh, after the game, <laughs> our, uh, our media guy comes up to me. He's like, Hey man, Hey, did, did you hear what I played? Uh, after you <laughs> made that save out there in the second. I'm like, Oh yeah. The, like the song, like, you know, lying in bed, just like Brian Wilson did. He's like, yeah, yeah. Like, have you heard that before? Did you know that was a thing? Like, that's so cool. Your name's in a song. I'm like, dude, I've had that song played for me in like every rink I've ever played in. Like, <laughs> I know you think you just found something, like, but it's, yeah, but uh, somebody else found it first. <laughs> it's, trust me, I've gotten that way too many times to count. So uh, I thought that was pretty funny. And he, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, too bad. I felt, I felt, uh, felt bad, kind of, you know right in his balloon there it's like yeah no, you, you, yeah you weren't the one to discover this unfortunately but uh you know i respect it so <laughs> do you get a lot of people that like say stuff to you about the beach boys or like being named brian wilson or not really oh yeah all the time yeah i'll say what's your name <laughs> oh brian wilson it doesn't matter if i'm you know somebody with hockey or you know yeah. at a store or something say like, oh like the Beach Boys, you ever, you know, you probably get that a lot. Like, yeah, I do get that a lot. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Sorry, oh, I mean, it's just you know, that's kind of what people do. You like, oh yeah, like whatever. No, you know? I know. Were, were your uh, parents it's... huge Beach Boys fans, or just coincidence? No, they they weren't it's kind of a coincidence. Um, <laughs> like I wasn't specifically named after them or anything. Yeah, uh, yeah. It just it just kind of worked out that way. Um. But, uh, yeah, no, it's fine. You know, it's, uh, if nothing else, it's a conversation starter. So yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. yeah you gotta have something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not bad. 
All right. Well, thanks for joining me on this episode of the pod. I enjoyed listening to your stories. You you, you lied. You said you weren't a good storyteller. Those were good stories. Man. They were interesting. <laughs> well, you know what? I've been uh, I've been a lot of places and seen a lot of faces these last couple of years. So yeah, uh, I've I've added a few to the repertoire. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I just gotta I just gotta get better at actually uh, telling them. But uh, yeah, you know, this. We'll count this as practice and uh, <laughs> yeah. right, and, right. Uh, so when you're really good yeah. someday, you can say, Hey, I fine tune my skills on the Twig Snapper podcast. That's that's kind of where I got it down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I'll uh, I'll make sure to let everybody know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. thanks again. Yeah, no problem. Uh appreciate you having me on and uh yeah, hopefully we'll uh, we'll chat again in the future. <laughs>